everybody welcome back to the cabin spring is finally here this is absolutely perfect out today it's going up to I think what uh, 14 degrees Celsius I think it is sunny nothing but sunshine all day and then tonight we've got um, heavy rain coming in thunderstorms and periods of rain for two or three days so that's spring perfect um, I need to focus kind of reshift my focus a little bit from the cabin onto the garden take advantage of this weather to get the air garden areas prepped um, and the one garden section that I started two years ago with the Hugo culture mounds and sort of raised beds I'm actually um, raising that soil up a little bit more so I can get higher production this year putting more nutrients onto the soil a lot more compost to uh, again build that up build the nutrient levels build the, the uh, moisture holding capacity of that soil because it's very poor on both of my garden sections or both of my garden plots and uh, then get it planted with all the cool weather crops now and then I can get back onto the cabin I'm gonna try to trim up those two logs that I need to pull out so I can, uh, when I get a break get up on that cabin and get those installed and then I've got all my building materials from there forward but I do need to get those two logs out I think there's still too much snow where they are to pull them out today, but I can definitely uh, limb them and, and cut them to length, get them ready. Um, I want to talk about nutrients in the garden a little bit though. Um, sort of a long story, I'm going to try to condense it, maybe split this into two or three videos to talk about, about nutrient levels and, and uh, quality of land. And I think that's a good place to start, quality of land. So as you know, this property I bought several years ago as a hunting property and it was reasonably priced because it was remote, hard to get to, uh, poor roads even on the way here and not fertile and not that useful for other purposes other than for wildlife essentially and, and, uh, and hunting. It's, it's quite a rugged remote piece of property. Um, low for fertility, so not great for growing, got this sandy acid areas are like this and then I've got the uplands that are call them uplands are a little bit higher in elevation that are uh, more rocky but some deeper pockets of soil where I have the hardwoods established so different types of of uh, little like micro climates basically micro ecosystems where they're quite vastly different from one small section to the next but all of it not um, suitable for agriculture it's low demand and therefore inexpensive so if you're looking for land and you're just starting out and you see the high prices of property at least um, in almost all of my area like all of Ontario essentially Ontario Canada prices are crazy for anything that's uh, you know any desirable properties so by getting into these unorganized townships that are sort of outside of uh, the areas that are have been developed over the years because they're more suitable either for agriculture they're prettier for for uh, recreation or whatever easier to get to um, those are too expensive these remote properties are still relatively well they're crazy expensive compared to what they were just a few years ago even a two years ago but they're um, definitely uh, more in reach for most people but it makes it much much more challenging to make them productive for a homestead so what i'm dealing with a couple of things one is that sunlight's an issue right so trying to get sunlight enough sunlight to grow annual vegetables and even a perennial garden is too difficult in the dense forest so in this case what i was you know when you saw for two years ago when i cleared the last plot it was fairly dense but hardwood forest and I was able to clear that, open it up, leave the stumps in place and kind of plant around it. And that soil wasn't um, quite as acidic and it was a little bit deeper and richer. But still quite sandy and too porous for holding moisture and not that nutrient dense. And also a little bit too acidic for typical crops. So this is even worse. <laughs> so this is almost pure sand underneath this thin layer of topsoil that's mostly been created by pines and spruces that have laid the needles down decompose um, so very acidic or quite acidic and a couple spots are a little bit better where there's some maples and things but anyway very porous very nutrient poor because of that porous porosity where the nutrients just wash right through it and very acidic 
So my challenge is to change those conditions. Um, and it's difficult. So what I'm going to do is sort of concentrate on pockets in this garden. Pockets where I'm actually planting each thing. So I had the fruit trees that I got started last year and a few perennials. that will show you what I would do is just dig out a hole essentially. Put some topsoil into that that I've dug up from somewhere else or, or brought in. Or uh, throw some compost in there and then plant it directly in that thing. So you might have, you know, I'll have some nutrient right here but as soon as the roots spread out they end up into this you know poor quality soil so i have to sort of build that out over time to get to increase the nutrient and nutrient density and um, moisture holding capacity of the soil beyond the, the current root zones so there's two ways i'm well there's really three ways i'm doing that so i've brought in some purchased soil and compost with the four-wheeler and on a trailer uh, as you saw last year when we built the greenhouse brought that in I have some farmers within like a hundred hundred kilometers or something like that where I can get a little bit of a uh, well, fair bit on a trailer to dump it where I park and then put it shovel it into the wagon behind the four-wheeler and then drag that out here but that's uh, composted really well composted cattle manure um, I've got another friend where we get our milk from which is even further so we only do this occasionally was get a trailer load of mostly goat manure well really again really well aged like several years old so it's not sustainable to do that over time bring in nutrients from somewhere else because it's essentially stealing the nutrients from that place but in those two cases those people have concentrated on raising animals rather than growing gardens so the manure that doesn't get spread up, spread on their their uh, pasture to improve that's that uh, their hay essentially gets um, put into these piles, uh, decomposes or compost, and then we're able to take that nutrient and bring it here. Uh, can't continue to do that. It's just not sustainably. It's not sustainable for either one of us, but it's also not efficient when I have to spend the fuel, especially with the really high cost of fuel now uh, for my truck to, in order to go get that stuff. Um, so what I need to do is start to grow as much nutrient on site as possible. Um, one other thing though is I go fishing as you know fairly often and uh, I've got the fish remains right here from the perch fishing that that uh, my wife Emily and I did this past winter. Um, kept all those small fish and a lot of people question the value of that um, but beyond getting those tiny little fillets off the fish themselves that we're eating all of the remains from those fish I knew I was harvesting it partially for that reason to keep those things from a place that had abundant fish and abundant nutrients taking that and then transporting it onto my land now the irony or sort of the backstory which I find interesting is that lake in particular where we uh, caught all those perch is close to where I grew up down in uh, just north of Toronto so that lake, well, I, so basically I grew up on the river that feeds into the lake and that river is where I spent my childhood learning how to fish and, and harvesting and harvesting fish from that area. Yeah, I bet there's going to be lots of float planes floating or <laughs> flying around today with this nice weather. Um, so yeah, so that lake is just super prolific. It's very uh, productive for growing, especially these small fish and it's a big lake. But the perch, it's just unbelievable how productive it is for them. So that uh, Lake Simcoe and Lake Kuchiching are the names of the lakes. They're, they're uh, heavily fished, but they're uh, sustainably fished. The populations continue to grow or continue to be stable. So I'm catching perch, catching fish from a place near where I grew up. Um, we're eating that fish. We're transporting the nutrients through excrement from my self and then also in the form of the the fish guts essentially and the the skins and heads so that's getting put into the soil here now that lake the reason part of the reason it's so productive is that you've got these rivers including that one that i grew up on the holland river running through agricultural land um, absorbing all the runoff in fact the holland marsh is one of our most productive uh, vegetable growing areas in Ontario 
and it's a huge marsh that's been basically converted into agricultural land you know I don't know how long ago 100 years ago and very flat very black deep rich soils that have been depleted of course like any agricultural land of natural nutrients decades many decades ago and now completely reliant on artificial and commercial fertilizer industrial fertilizer synthetic fertilizers probably for the most part so all of that washes into the canal system of the Holland Marsh into the Holland River and then into the lake and it creates this um, it's like basically you're fertilizing then the lake right so all the aquatic plants are growing up fish are eating the aquatic plants the minnows or the other small invertebrates and then the fish come in and eat that and then the bigger fish eat those and so on the possible toxin uh, load um, is upcycled throughout that that um, food chain so this the largest fish of course accumulate more toxins um, like mercury for example but others as well um, so the larger the fish is and the fattier that fish is like a like a trout for example leg trout that there's a lot of in that lake would have the highest uh, toxin load so eating eating small or lower on the food chain such as the small perch there's no there's less toxic buildup um, so it's it's um, you know safer and healthier to eat those small fish but the point being that you're getting all this nutrient runoff from the whole surrounding area down there and that's artificially overloading that system with nutrients so to pull fish out of there like I did and transport that nutrient to somebody somewhere else completely is is actually um, not degrading the system so it's not like it's really stealing nutrients from a place where it's needed you know, where there's a, a um, yeah, need for that so transporting it to a new place where it's being put to good use is actually probably not a bad thing uh, the thing I would want to be aware of though and not do too much of is how much of that is potentially toxic I don't want to add that to this relatively pristine environment here that has not been you know industrialized very few people live in this area at all uh, no real other gardens of any significance other than maybe a couple of small plots that they've got in their backyard or in their yards around their property somewhere so we have a an opportunity to keep this this environment fairly pristine so I'm trying to again for that reason just grow as much of that nutrient that I need on on property or we'll just steal it from the immediate area so that I'm not uh, potentially like I said bringing in toxins or weeds or something else that are not native to the spot what I've done here is created this charcoal um, and the charcoal is really good at because um, it has a lot of surface area really good at absorbing nutrients and then holding on to it and very slowly releasing it over a long time so <laughs> you saw me pee into this bucket into this trough full of charcoal so that's adding nitrogen and because I'm not on any medications it's very it's sterile high in nitrogen and and low in toxicity so that's adding the nitrogen I need into this charcoal also the fishes as well and uh, it's been decomposing for a little while now I'm going to put that into the bottom of the tomato beds and that will provide the nutrients required for this year and some future years to grow good good tomatoes in that case now the other side of that is that I, like I said I can't keep or I don't want to or I don't think it's sustainable to keep bringing in nutrients from the outside so I besides going into the gar into the forest right here br pulling out uh, composted leaves and soil and bark and and old dead wood and stuff like that I'm also growing things specifically for building compost um, comfrey is a really good source of of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus because it has a really deep tap root and that goes down deep into the ground pulls all the nutrients from there up into its leaves grows a ton of big leaf and then I can chop that throw it onto the garden that decomposes adds those nutrients back into the soil at the so soil level at the surface and then regrows I could do that probably two three times a year and then that plant also continues to to uh, spread um, 
through rhizomes through the the root system if you chop up the roots for, in other words spread those out um, those will grow new plants but I've also grown them from seed this year for the first time so I've got this you know a couple of flats and right here in the greenhouse that I'm going to take out and plant today um, hot and dry today but several days of rain coming that should water it in deeply and it's then it's frost tolerant being a um, perennial that grows every, back every year and comes up in the spring uh, I wouldn't bother planting them out now for risk of frost other than the, no, but because I've seen that the plants that are already well established are putting out their um, some growth right now then I'm confident that I can get away with doing that right now in the garden rhubarb's another one that does that big plant big leaf can chop that use that as a as a mulch and as a compost material and uh, that'll continue to grow as well and it'll continue to get bigger and spread every year so I've got several of those planted as well the other thing is uh, stinging nettle really high source of nitrogen as well I grew that from seed two years ago and again I think I did last year as well I'm spreading that around and that's starting to come up out of the ground already even though it's only April 12th or 13th right now and that's uh, something I'm going to go continue to chop and and drop it or put it in the compost pile or put it into the the uh, uh, charcoal so I can create biochar that's full of nutrients in order to spread that and get that into the ground uh, around each plant another source of uh, compost material is just the vegetable plants themselves and the the unusable parts of the parts that I don't use such as uh, corn stalks for example or um, the sun chokes the uh, Jerusalem artichoke great big stem you know four or five six maybe even eight feet tall ten feet tall chop that down at the end of the season or after it um, collapses from from dying off to go dormant for the winter throw that in the compost pile uh, add some greens and just have you know abundant to us <laughs> compost that I've naturally um, created myself here from the on the property that yeah, flies out already a little bit of heat and they come in but they're smelling the fish and going in so I'm gonna get that mixed up and buried into the garden before more more bugs find it and probably bears are gonna be out this week I would say in fact big males could be out uh, already wandering around looking for stuff to eat so and start to uh, get <laughs> all the odors suppressed not so I don't attract them in here right now all right I've got a lot of work to do I have to take advantage of this good day so um, if you're interested in watching this stuff I'm going to continue to put it on this channel I really want to encourage people to spend as much time um, forming deeper relationships with their food and with their land so I'm going to like I said keep sharing that stuff you know, more and more the things that I feel are benefiting me that might benefit as you might, might benefit you as well and uh, I'll encourage people especially in these trying times in this transitional period that we're living through to uh, make a choice to to live um, have closer to the land and f build um, more deep relationships with community and, and environment and food so um, if you're interested in that please subscribe and um, I'd like to hear your comments and your questions as well and I look forward to seeing you back here at the cabin and the homestead and the gardens next time take care <music>